The Bain Free Radio Hour. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afsharirad. Listeners and viewers of the podcast may well remember this week's guest from our Welcome to New Authors Roundtable that we hosted on the podcast a few weeks ago. Gregory Frost is new to Bain, and we couldn't be more excited to welcome him into the fold. Today, he discusses his first novel for us, which reinvents Thomas the Rhymer in a way that only he could do it. But first, the news. The Insomniac by Brad Zeiger is the winner of the 2023 Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award Contest. I had the pleasure of presenting the award to Mr. Zeiger at the International Space Development Conference last month. The story embodies the ideals of the contest, which is co-sponsored by Bain Books and the National Space Society, presenting a plausible, positive near-future point of view. So head on over to Bain.com and check out The Insomniac now, and congratulations again, Brad. And that's it for the news. Hello, uh, Bain Free Radio Hour listeners. This is uh, DJ Dave Butler. Uh, I'm here with Gregory Frost to talk about his new novel, Rhymer, out now in hardback and in also all your favorite ebook formats, DRM free when you buy them from uh, Bain.com, as always. Greg, welcome to the uh, radio hour. Well, thanks. Thanks, Dave, very much. So, uh, I have to say, this is an interview. I'm supposed to ask you questions, but I'm going to say I'm going to say things from time <laughs> okay. to time. Okay. Um, uh, quite delightful with kind of the central, uh, or quite delighted with by the central conceit of the novel and kind of uh, the basic setup. And and I want to ask you a little bit about because there's a there's a there's a major real world uh, root to this story, and, and I want to wonder if you could tell us about. Um, uh i guess uh thomas of air i think it's ersildon is that how it's pronounced ersildon yes right yeah, yeah. There, there is a real person here right who is also already a, a character of literature uh, and i wonder if you could comment on that and i'd love to hear about how the story kind of came to your mind well if yeah okay if you uh if you want to go to thomas of He's he's got various names: Thomas Lermont, Thomas this, Thomas that, and Thomas of Ersildund being being one of them, uh, who ostensibly lived in the 1200s um, as a real character, uh, but then becomes the subject of a uh, Scottish ballad, Thomas the Rhymer, which probably is the way most people would would have encountered him, if if at all. Um, this all started out as a discussion over beers with author Jonathan Mayberry way back, I, I would think around 2012, maybe. Um, there was a, a collection of stories by, uh, I'm going to look here and cheat because I've got it here, Christopher Golden edited it called mm. Dark, Dark Duets. And it was, as the title suggests, it was to be stories co-written by two authors. Mm. And Jonathan approached me and said, do you want to do a story I want to do a story about Thomas the Rhymer and I went yeah sure because I know the the history of Thomas the Rhymer and I know the ballad really well um and Jonathan being Jonathan at, at that period said something along the lines of I was thinking zombies and I'm going no we're not going to do zombies <laughs> no <laughs> he's not battling zombies um and so he also is somebody who just has a full plate almost all the time and said and basically said you do the first draft you do whatever you want with the first draft pass it off to me and, and we'll go um so i tried writing the origin story of thomas um as we kind of had talked about it over as i say over beers and it was just too big a story to do as a novella which is what these are these dark duet stories are all novellas between two authors couldn't make it fit. I tried, I don't know, half a dozen different ways of trying to work the the origin in and, and it didn't go anywhere. And finally just gave up and wrote a contemporary thriller with Thomas in the 20th century, still doing what he's starting to do in this very first book. Um, and 
that went into dark duets jonathan did his second pass on it etc and uh and we revised it back and forth polished it between the two of us and turned it in uh pretty quickly and then i don't know i just was sitting on that idea and the fact that i hadn't been able to do the origin story really bugged me and i kept going back to it and i finally uh with his permission we we talked about this quite a bit um decided i would write the origin story of thomas and and just get it out there um and that's sort of what i did so i plunged back into the research um which became sort of an essential part of the story uh in the sense if i knew the 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 ballad of thomas the rhymer i kind of knew the elements of it what happened in in that ballad um, and then in digging around and doing other research, I realized that another ballad that I knew pretty well, Tam Lin, uh, which is a 14th century ballad, um, 14th or 15th, 15th century ballad, I take it back, um, is almost like the sequel. It's almost like Tam Lin is the story of a woman named Janet who falls in love with this character who's already possessed by the queen of fairy, the queen of Elfland, um, which sort of sounds like Thomas, who was taken for a ride through Elfland by the queen in, in that ballad, uh, and, and, and a ride through hell as well. Um, and I thought, and, and the other thing is, they occur within something like 10 miles of each other. So the district of Carter Hall, which is mentioned in, in Tam Lin, is very close to Huntley Bank, which is the place name in the very first line of the ballad of Thomas the Rhymer. So it's like, it's the same guy, but it's, you know, like 200 years apart. So that's kind of the direction I went in. And, and Jonathan and I had always wanted to, we're always intending to explore this idea of him being a kind of Michael Moorcock eternal champion. And so with those elements in mind, I just started digging into the research of uh, the time period, uh, archery and uh, and warfare and mercenaries and the whole nine yards. And also the, the beginnings of towns as we understand them um, in this same period. And uh, it just sort of snowballed and it kind of took its own course. Um, and the only difference is I made the... Uh, the elves, a kind of alien species. So they're they're not just elves. They're much worse than that. So yeah. if that's possible. <laughs> so uh just as a just as a note for for listeners, um, you know, uh in in the context of modern pop music, the ba word ballad often means something like a, a a big emotion love song. But of course we're talking right. about ballad as a genre of long narrative songs yes. um, uh, such as are collected in the child ballads or yeah so, my, uh, and my in fact my friend delia sherman says that old english and old scottish ballads are just stories with all of the uh, motivations removed so all the things happen, but it, the song never explains why somebody's hunting somebody down to cut their heart out or, you know, something. I mean, there are no motivations. They're just happening. And and I kind of like that. That's uh, that's fun. Um, OK, so um, so I actually don't know that ballad. I know, there, I, I know many, but uh, I'm, I, uh, I I have to have to go read uh, Thomas the Rhymer and Tam Lin. So, um, so, so one of the, I was reminded of various works. Um, I think one of the sort of nearest comparisons that came to my mind uh, was the High Crusade. I, and I meant to look this up. I think that's Gordon Dixon. Uh, oh, wow. Gordy Dixon. That goes way back. Yeah. Right. Which is uh, Gordon. And the High Crusade is about... Um, Oh, I want to say it's like sort of uh, 14th century England and an alien ship lands and the little green men get out and the English soldiers kill it and uh, take over the right. spaceship and figure out how to work it. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that sounds like Gordy Dixon. Yeah. 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 There's a little kind of reminiscence of that in that in that the the, the setting is, is medieval, right? It's 13th century 
kind of lowland Scotland. Is that the area we're talking about? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely lowland Scotland. It's border, around, border Wales. Yeah, it's like uh, what 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 would be called now, I guess, Lothian borders. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, but it begins uh, it begins with this this uh, uh, with a with a, a cross world a multi world encounter and we meet our hero uh, and everything is not quite right with him. Um, right. Tell us about the the opening scene there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the many uh, improvisations on my part uh, of the ballad. In in the original ballad, he meets the Queen of Fairies while he's sort of just lying around on Huntley Bank. Um, so here he meets the Queen of Fairies. He's on Huntley Bank because his brother and his brother's closest friend have dragged him along so that they can go fishing because they're required to take him with them because he's essentially uh, an idiot. Um, they're, you know, he's damaged. He's, he's, he's not really a functioning human being. And he, he's kind of a savant in the sense that, you know, you point at a tree and you say, how many branches? And he goes, you know, 470. It's just like, he's weird that way. Uh, but he just doesn't string us together very well. And there's always noise in his head effectively. Um, so I tried to write a character like that. And then very quickly, um, they go off fishing and he sort of daydreams away, counting one thing or another, lying in the grass. And suddenly the queen of fairies is you know, staring down at him, the queen of elves. And on a whim, because she can hear that he's damaged, she can hear his mind, she fixes him. And there's even a line at that point that she doesn't realize that she is changing all of history for her people, for the world, by this one little act that she does where she straightens his thoughts out. And well, it changes him. And he ceases to be what he was uh, and will grow into a, you know, a role as their nemesis over time. But that's, that's basically the, the introduction of it. Yeah. And he's he's still not completely neurotypical, maybe, right? I mean, he has um, true. He has ongoing seizures, um, uh, and em emerging from which he utters, uh, or or in the depths of which he utters uh, these kind of r prophetic riddles, um, which if he's alone he can't capture, which is a very interesting kind of uh, right, you know, idea. He needs somebody to hear him. Yes, right. Exactly. Yeah. And and that connects to I think to the at least the Thomas of Ursuldon recoverable by folklore, right? Because I think Walter Scott apparently circulating in folklore, there were prophetic uh, couples, couplets, or little riddles that were believed to yep. be by Thomas Lermont, which yep. um, were believed to to prophesy various things, including there was one that was a prophecy talked about the North ruling the South and was thought to be a prophecy of James the sixth of scotland james the first of england king james of the bible fame um, yeah i collected a lot of the supposedly real things that he riddled and and a lot of them as you might expect are up there with nostradamus and that they don't make the slightest bit of sense and you can sort of take whatever he said and apply it to any specific situation you want and say look he prophesied this and some of them are just nuts i mean there are things like the the teeth of the lambs will do such and such when you know when the snow falls or something it's just you read it and you go nope no clue what you're talking about there at all so i incorporated those into the book as well so there are real rhymes or riddles that he real things that he spouted while he's having fits um that don't make any more sense than the, the actual things that thomas of Learmouth supposedly said Right. Um, one wonders if you say enough things and make sure they get written down, maybe some of them will come to be seen as prophetic in the future. <laughs> it's possible. And the other thing I did was uh, a friend of mine, a professor at Swarthmore, in fact, Craig Williamson, had written a book on old English riddles. Um, and I used his book to kind of pattern some of the more important riddles that Thomas says throughout the book. Um, so I was using a kind of pattern of, of riddles that actually existed to uh, 
to riff on while I'm doing Thomas at the same time. Fantastic. Um, so, okay. So for Thomas, uh, Thomas is transformed. Um, uh, the encounter doesn't go quite as well for his brother, Anshu, and for their friend, Baldy. Right. Well, in fact, so in the song, it's Thomas who's taken to uh, Elfland uh, as a tithe. And I wanted to keep him on this side of the world for as long as possible, obviously. So I have him watching his brother taken to the other side as, as, the, as the tithe or the tind that uh, that the elves pick up um and so for him it's a it's a story of revenge for for the fact that they've stolen his brother away and then they don't stop screwing with his family after that that's you know just the beginning of it um but so yeah instead of him being taken away he sort of charges at them and tries to rescue his brother and they're taking him through a portal that they've created into their realm and as that portal is closing up, he rams right into it and is basically flung through time and, you know, comes to his senses and three years have gone by and he has no idea of that. Um, but he's disappeared from the world for three years. Yeah. So he's had this kind of encounter. Uh, the monsters are, are uh, and, and there are hints in the first scene, right? He recognizes uh, he, he, one of the, yeah. these human figures uh and they've sort of permit these elves who look like spiky uh you know plate plate clad knights but 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 strange sort of infernal looking plate um and uh but but the humans one of them uses the title alderman right and i think i think he yes. he's seen him before um so there's a a lot of the book has this uh, a little bit of the feel of kind of um, like Zorro or the Scarlet Pimpernel, <laughs> right? Yes, where... Zorro's a big influence here. Yes, right. okay, very good. Um, where uh, and we'll talk about the elves in a minute, kind of who they who they are, what we know about them, what they're what what we come to learn about them. We know nothing at first, right? Right, and right. what they're doing. But there are human quislings here. There are human cooperators, or at least they look like cooperators, right? They're like, or they, they look, look like humans. Look yes, like the right. humans. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, who are people in in high places, right? Because because who do you want if you're going to control and exploit the population? Like you, you want absolutely the ultimate, uh, right? The bishop. You don't yeah. want yeah the the you know the turf cutter or whatever. Um. Yeah, in fact, there's a one of the riddles that Thomas gives uh, in, somewhere in the book that's uh, really one of the key riddles that runs through the whole series is this idea of of these creatures uh, being obsessed with or or grabbing kingdoms, but they're never kings. In other words, they don't put themselves on the throne, but they're always the influencers behind the scenes in the shadows, saying, yeah. "You need to do this and and make this happen, or you need to go start this war," and you know that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, yeah, so there's this feeling where, in a in a sense, because um, uh, he he's of a small landed kind of family, but it's sort of the way it kind of feels is he's sort of the hero. He is the hero of humanity against the elves, but also kind of against their own leaders. Right. And so it has that kind of yeah. rebel. On Potentially. The yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. He gets booted out of the gate, uh, comes, comes conscious. Um, and he gets picked up by uh, a, a guy who's sort of become his, going to become his mentor. Um Tell us, if you would, a little bit about the uh, um, about Alpen Waldrup. Well, Waldrup is a is a stone cutter, but Waldrup has also been a mercenary in the past, and he's doing this now because you live longer if you you know essentially if you do this. Mercenaries don't have a very long long life. Plus, uh, as as the book on on medieval mercenaries I read pointed out, once you know once they've done what they were set out to do once they've succeeded in conquering their foes for the king they're basically paid off and sent away and so their job is done you know and they've got to go look for another battle to fight someplace else uh and half the time the the leaders of the thing will cut a deal and 
say, okay, we're not going to fight anymore. You guys go home, you know, and they're screwed. So uh, it, it was a lousy life being a mercenary in a lot of ways. Um, and by the way, you're like in Germany or you're in, you know, you're in North Italy or something like you're 500. Exactly. Home. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but so, so Waldrop kind of adopts him and becomes a, a, a mentor and a kind of a father figure for him and teaches him pretty much everything because at this point he's almost a tabula rasa he's he's a you know he's known nothing until 15 minutes before he got blasted away um so he's learning what he is and waldrop teaches him how to be a stone cutter and he seems to have a a natural gift for that and then through their discussions and conversations thomas uh wants to learn what waldrop knows about about fighting and Waldrop was an archer. So, you know, he, uh, he wants to know how to shoot a, a bow himself. And eventually Aldrip uh, or uh, Waldrop, um, I keep, I keep switching between Alpin and Waldrop. Uh, Waldrop uh, agrees to do that and, um, and starts teaching him how to, how to run and fire a bow at the same time and hit your target. And, you know, um, I take, maybe a little liberties with how quickly he develops as a as an archer He's, he becomes very skillful in less than a year which i'm not sure you would do but for the purposes of the book yeah he becomes very skillful within a year and uh and then the situation develops in such a way that they have to abscond and go back to the mercenary life for a period of time yeah yeah and, and they they waldrop has seen had an experience waldrop believes him Yes, because Waldrop's had a similar experience. Um, uh, down fighting, I guess. Uh, let's see, a hundred years war, right? Uh, yes, yeah. So yeah, where he's he was lying in a battlefield and uh, had been wounded, and saw these people, um, who had come out, who are again sort of like the aldermen that we've encountered in the in the story, going along the battlefield and finding somebody who's wounded. And essentially going, okay, that's our tithe for the day, and you know, picking them up and taking them off to Elfland. So no. he's actually watched this take place once. No. Yeah. And um, so uh, they they have you know some some initial uh, conflicts or contacts with the with the elves in England before they flee. As you say, situations develop. Um, they they one of the things they realize is that the the creatures are using um, cathedrals. They're using tombs, um, which which is, uh, I think, a delightful image because it, it sort of, although these are not, you know, they're not undead, but the, at least not, maybe not the way we think about it. Um, right. But there are, uh, it gives them a lot of resonance of that sort of, you know, there's sort of connections with these, holy sites and there's a couple times early on we have characters sort of reminding each other hey this place was actually a holy site before the monks ever showed up right right um so there's there's this there's this uh you know uh, sort of and we, and we never fully explore this in the book but there there are places of power or there are residues of power that these people are tapping into um one of the things they also do is they take uh, there are these little devices that the elves carry little look like little slick rocks, uh, something like uh, um, uh, I mean I, I, in my head I see it, it's looking something like a, a computer's mouse but smaller like a smooth rounded stone but with light yeah. light up in sequence and different colors. Yeah, I think at one point Thomas thinks of them as skipping stones, like he and his brother used to skip across the water, that kind of thing. And that's what I was thinking was a round black stone that's got sort of scalloped edges and uh, and little lights that blink on and off and actually are very complex, but he doesn't know that. You know, he knows they do one thing because he's seen them do one thing, but right. he'll find out by book two that they do more than one thing. So I yeah. Know. L late I don't in, want to give that away. So no, no, no. Late in the book, he's saying he he he's realized that the 
uh, elves' mounts are more docile, or at least he believes they're more docile when the stones are around. Yeah, but right. but what but what's the one thing? So they take with them this art a cup, and they have several, right? They have a like a or maybe they have just the one. I can't remember. Uh, what is it? What is the one thing that they know that it does? Talk to well, us the about one it. thing that the okay, the one thing that the Ord Stone does because he's actually seen that happen when Anku is taken away, is it slits open the world. It's sort of like the. Uh, what the I can't remember the title of the book now. Philip Pullman's second book with the uh, the knife oh. that mm -hmm. cuts open the world. It sort of does the same thing. It slices open uh, a gateway or a portal into uh, the world of the elves, Elfion or Elfland or Elfheim. It all it has many many names. Has had many many names in various cultures. Um, so he actually watches somebody open and close the world that very first time um and that stone is the way that they they do that that's the way they open and close the world so when he encounters the uh, characters the figures asleep in these tombs um they've all been uh supplied with their own stone so that when they do wake up they can go immediately and get out get out of the world and go back home to their to their world yeah and so those stones kind of become a critical uh, element of the story. Yeah, yeah, a critical tool for him uh, mm -hmm. at various points. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, storytelling logic dictates that from the moment Dumbledore or Obi-Wan Kenobi walks onto the stage, <laughs> you know he's going to die or, or get out of the way somehow so the hero yeah. can shine, right? So we, Waldrop gets out of the way. Um, and Thomas, uh, Thomas comes back, um, to, uh, com comes back home, uh, and, um, uh, and, and things have gotten worse, right? What's, I get, yeah, I guess you'd say that. Yeah. He goes off for about five years being a mercenary and, and returns, uh, with a piece of paper that says that you know such and such a landowner has to give him a piece of land um for his services to the to the crown um scootage i believe it was called and and that's real so um that that would have taken place for some of the um some of the soldiers the mercenaries um and so he comes back and tries to live a a quiet life back there but at the same time he's kind of checking up on what the situation is with the uh, the elves at this point, because he and Waldrop fled, having uh, encountered and dispatched a couple of them in the first place, which is what drove them to go to France and become uh, soldiers again. Um, so he's on the one hand trying to seem like a a good guy and and uh, and a, you know just a decent tenant farmer and that sort of thing, but on the other hand, he's watching the uh the place where they know there are bodies lying in the tombs that belong to these creatures um and yeah things haven't gone particularly well his his sister um who he had to abandon in order to leave basically has been sent off to uh, uh as a mad woman to uh a uh, a nunnery if you will um uh, and uh and his father as he discovers is now one of these creatures that's been taken over by the elves and so again as i say they keep screwing with his family so at the point where he would have gone you know i had my fight with you i'm done i'm gonna leave this alone they've just come back at him again so he feels like he doesn't have any choice yeah and and uh, there are scenes where you know like Zoro he sort of passes among them and they're they're trying to figure out you know who is this and he's he's in society um but right. he's also lying in wait at places where he know they're gonna because these elves are on a regular basis going out and selecting humans to take back with them yeah they need to collect their tithe periodically uh we find out uh later in the book it's because there's a a second 
group of creatures that we never see. We don't really know anything about them called the unseely. Um, and they're, they're sacrificing the tithe or the tind that they collect from the humans to the this unseen third party that scares the crap out of them. So imagine how dangerous these yeah. things are, whatever, whatever they are. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they glamor them so that it looks like they're themselves elves before throwing them into this, uh, this abyss, this sort of black hole. Well, yeah. um, as a sacrifice. And they do that because they are as a race, uh, sterile at this point or nearly sterile so they can't afford to sacrifice any of their own people so they're taking human tithes as it turns out because they need something to throw in there to appease this other entity that we never see but we know exists no yeah. never see yet it, this being never see yet yes that's true yes yeah right. so um so uh and and the, the elves so that they, they have the the power to seem different from they are what they are they they also have uh some powers of transformation uh, uh and right. obviously the first thing we see about the elf queen is she's she's got uh, and maybe this is a way to think about this is her power of transformation but she heals thomas on a whim right so right so they're so they're powerful um thomas at this point uh, this is where he has the ride through fairy and the ride through hell because uh, he gets he gets caught, right? Um, and uh, so, so tell us about some of the things he sees. He 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 becomes a prisoner of the fairy for um, uh, Earth time at least twenty years. Subjectively, yes, right. His subjective sense of time is is messed up by all sorts of things that are happening. So right um what's that like what do they what do they do to him what does he see well they do all <laughs> they do all sorts of things to him um but he passes through this thing called thagglewood which is potentially uh a kind of graveyard for these creatures we don't ever see that are the the so-called unseely uh but we don't really know what they are um he finds out later that the the elves collect or seem to collect pieces of these tree-like creatures that they've broken apart or cut down. He's not really ever privy to what exactly is going on, but eventually discovers that there, there's a kind of underground world that is the power, uh, the sort of self, what do I want to say, self-driving, uh, self-replicating, self-repairing universe underneath it all that's sort of the arthur c clark magic you know the most advanced you know anything that's a, cer a certain level of advanced science looks like magic um in this case it's some kind of advanced technology but everything in the world seems to be built from these creatures and the pieces of them that he sees seem to know inherently how they're supposed to go together et cetera, et cetera. so they're kind of what I had in mind anyway, and, and, and where this all came from, is it's a sort of combination of H.G. Wells, Eloy, and Morlocks, and um, and the city of the Krell from, from Forbidden Planet. It's this idea of this giant underground landscape that takes care of itself, uh, in part because the, the elves don't know how any of this stuff operates anymore. They're not making any of the machinery. It's all being made for them. Um, and has been for millennia. So they're really kind of hoping, assuming things will just run along the way that they always have. And, uh, and in, in some ways, it, it's potentially a weakness for them. But that hasn't been explored in the first book. He's just sort of come to figure that out and is ultimately um, used and abused and um, I guess you'd say raped by the queen. Um, I don't know what else you'd call it. Uh, it's it's sort of a horrific nightmare ride for him. And eventually, uh, when she's tired of him, she tosses him in a prison and he ends up in a supposedly un inescapable prison along with the poet Taliesin, who's been there since the 800s. So uh, 
yeah, as you were saying, time runs a little different in, in Elfland as it does in, in a lot of the mythologies of of the world of the 12th of Day to Nan and, and creatures like that. Yeah. So it's, it's wonderful, you know, the, the whole kind of vibe of uh, Alfion. Uh, and, and it's wonderful the way that echoes Albion, you know, well, well done. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it was a real word. I, I can't take credit for inventing it. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, it, it is very kind of Michael Moorcock feeling, right? So, so Thomas's paradigm for understanding all this is sort of sorcery and madness, and it feels like this sort of dark, gothic fantasies, and right. And uh, although it's clear as we go along that that it's um, that there's a, there are mechanism involved and devices, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, the, yeah, he he gets the the the, the, el the elves have a fertility problem. Like the queen tells him this, as she is basically trying to harvest a child off him for what right. subjectively seems to him like sort of centuries. Right? It's, yes, he's, he's being forced to perform far beyond his limits, and it's, it's horrible. Uh, and sometimes he's he's transformed to do it, and sometimes she's transformed, and this is, is a nightmare. Um, Yes, and uh, she keeps she keeps referencing his wife and his sister and anybody she can pluck out of his thoughts or his mind. Yes. So he doesn't know who he's who he's doing this with, even while it, it's happening. Um, and yep. to an extent, for what it's worth, uh, with her in particular, with Nick Nevin, the Queen, um, I kind of went back to a a C.J. Cherry novel called Hunter of Worlds, a very early uh, C.J. Cherry novel, where she's got this kind of alien queen figure and one thing i really love about that book is the fact that she never goes into the point of view of that queen so you never know what the queen is thinking um, other than what she says you don't have access to her interiority and so i made a, a special point of trying to do that with nick nevin that we don't really know what's going on with her we don't really understand how she thinks how she you know how she does anything or why she does anything necessarily and i wanted to keep her that way through the series i want her to be this kind of unknown quantity yeah um and and you've referenced this but i, I want to just just talk about the image a little bit the uh uh we we see where the tithes um not where they end up but where the elves throw them right um and and basically what it looks like is thomas's looking in and forced to watch a sacrifice right and the elves sacrifice someone who is not who they think she is that right that sort of try to get at him uh is a person falls into this pit which they call hell or there's a goddess hell in there and falls very very slowly <clears throat> and basically is pulled apart like it's a it's a it's a torture death right. uh and and this is somehow the thing that the uns again we don't know who they are we hear their name a handful of times right yeah, somehow right. the unseelie are imposing this on the on the elves yes they, as a oh, price of some kind yes right yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, so we meet Talius and so so this felt I like so this this felt to me almost like sort of. Um, Edgar Rice Burroughsy, like they're you know, <laughs> heroes trapped naked in a sort of a prison that's a device, and he has to try and figure out the device to get out. Um, yeah. And uh, and he's got this poet who's a who's a little bit maybe uh, tenuous in his grasp on his sanity. We should say this is a real guy, <laughs> or at least this yes, is a real. Yes, re was yeah. real. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he even recites one of his or parts of one of the real poems. Uh, attributed to Taliesin, so yeah, yeah, the Battle yeah. of the Trees, which is actually a yeah, yeah. A hyper famous one. This is the book Robert uh, Graves wrote his famous book, The White Goddess, as an exploration. White goddess, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, So, uh, and uh, he's also, I, I should say, a, a bit of comic relief in in some ways too. So, yeah, he has a lot of parts to play, Taliesin. Yeah, in the in the tradition of like the genius scientist or the wizard having a slightly comical edge, you know, yeah. uh, like Merlin can get played that way or Dr. Dr. Zharkov or somebody. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, 
and 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 one of the things he learns uh is is somehow uh Tallison has a kind of a an or an oral an a, an audio connection with the people who are being sacrificed yeah um and uh the for some part of that journey as they're falling falling apart but they still have consciousness he can hear them um and they can hear him mm-hmm. um and uh, uh, without going into the details, because it's it's a fun Edgar Rice Burroughsy kind of prison escape. Uh, oh, but it's his brother Anku, yes, right, who was falling to that pit, not quite gone yet. Yes, not quite, not quite dead yet. Yes, not, exactly. Yes, not dead yet. Uh, <laughs> not dead yet. Right. I'm feeling better. Right. Yeah. Feeling exactly. better. Uh, <laughs> gives gives him the suggestion you know he's sort of yeah. he's like on the on the brink of figuring it out and he's like oh, oh i see how this wor- mechanism works and his brother gives Talison the suggestion that, that uh, enables him to get out um right. he uh he he uh and we're skipping lots of detail there boy listeners there's just so much we're skipping all of the uh specificity and 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 uh, uh there's just so much here you're gonna love it the um on the way out he has a kind of a uh transformation experience um uh because another piece that we we haven't touched on is that the because of their fertility problem Mm -hmm. one of the things they do is they do is that the elves are stealing children uh human children maybe other species we don't we don't we don't know right but human children and and trying to transform them into something that is elf like or part elf. Yeah, so this this basically is playing with the the whole uh fairy notion of changelings where the elves or the fairies come and they steal a baby and they replace it with a a bundle of twigs or something and the mother doesn't recognize that anything's happened to it or she thinks her baby has died because they've taken the real one away. Um here the evog or the elves have done exactly that. They're they're collecting uh, human babies uh, to turn them into evogs. They have a they have a, a a sort of magical pool that they can immerse the uh, the child in, and they've developed a ritual that goes with this, and as as you would expect to some extent, and they turn them. They turn the children into uh, sort of baby elves. Um, you know, it sort of genetically modifies and alters them uh, through immersion um, inside and out. And um, Thomas in his escape runs into this pool or discovers this pool and is forced to climb into it in order to hide so that the queen and and her soldiers don't encounter him. Um, And it's another thing where something accidentally changes him and he doesn't realize the scope of that change uh even in this book he hasn't fully realized the scope of the the change of getting into that pool and what it's done to him yeah um, on his way out of town so to speak yeah um so uh he gets out um there's a there's a great plant and payoff kind of uh Going back to Al- Alp and Waldrop that helps him get out of the yep. gets out through the forest of bony trees, um, and uh, and yeah, he's transformed. He, he has something um, you know in our current parlance we might say superpowers. He has he's he's no longer human. Some of these abilities right. of kind of glamour and transformation and other things and healing, right? Um, mm-hmm. Thomas has. Um, and so now he's really pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Re- really pissed and really screwed over both. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 time to take matters into his own hands, as it were. Yeah, it's been twenty years. Uh, his uh, his his daughter is grown. Yeah, his wife has taken to his his wife took his daughter twenty years ago to a convent in France and left her there because they both expected to die at any moment that the, the elves would come after her too. Um, so she's waited for him 
uh, Penelope like for 20 years, you know, just watching to see if he would come back through this gate because he told her where it was. Um, and he finally does. Uh, he finally comes back through, but in keeping with the the ballad of Tam Lin, um, she tries to pull him down off of this horse. And in the process, he keeps transforming. And in this case, he keeps transforming because he's not in control of what's happened to him because of being in that pool. But it's still pretty much the same thing as in the in the ballad of Tam Lin, where he Tam Lin goes through all of these shape shifting creatures and things that he is before he finally you know um comes back to himself and and he tells janet in the ballad to not let go of him if she doesn't let go of him then uh she'll get to keep him and the queen of, of fairies will have no choice but to release him and that's exactly what happens in the ballad but i took that element and, and made sure it was embedded deep in uh in this story as well so that's where that comes back uh, yeah from the, from the music yeah and that's a wonderful old motif in um uh in celtic i'm thinking specifically kind of welsh folklore mm -hmm. and poetry mm -hmm. you know, and gwydion are associated with transformation you see these right. stories in like the mabinogion um so it's got a it's got a it's got so many greg it's got so many great kind of roots in the in the real uh world and its history but also its literary corpus it's uh it oh, yeah. very very real very well done a lot of fun thank you yeah well i had a lot of fun with it it's i've gone into this territory before uh back in the 80s i wrote two books based on the toy boat colonia that the irish cavalry of cooley and it's exactly what you say uh the main character there kuholan is transformed over and over and over again and in fact he's semi-divine and one of the things that happens to him is a thing called the warp spasm takes over when somebody pisses him off he just loses control and his body turns in you know turns into this half monster and so the side of him that's gone monstrous is the side you don't really want to interact with because he'll rip you to pieces um so there's a lot of but there's a lot of transformation throughout that story and as you say throughout the mabinogian and uh and any number of of, of celtic works yeah yeah so, um, so, so that doesn't take us all the way through the story, but I think the end is just sort of the great, the great hunt, the great, the great battle against the elves, um, and uh, and uh, and then overall, the whole story, as you say, is is the origin story. Or it's the tale of sort of right. humankind's avenger. Um, so I know I understand you're writing book two, and and we're building this as the Rhymer trilogy. Um, what? What, if anything, maybe the comment, maybe the answer is nothing, but what, if anything, would you like to tell us about the future books in the series? <laughs> well, I'm in, I'm deep in the second book right now. I'm revising it. I, I finished the draft of it in, uh, in April and I'm going through and revising it right now. Um, the idea, I didn't plan to write a trilogy. I just planned to write the origin story and that was it. And Tony mm -hmm. Weiskopf, uh, came back and said, I want three books. And I went, oh, okay. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, I kind of had. I mean, I very quickly had sketched out the possibility of three books because of this notion that he lives through time. And Jonathan and I had already written him in the 21st century. So arguably, I could write every single book all the way down to the 21st century if you wanted to go that route. Um, so anyway, she uh, she asked for three books. And so I developed him out from the end of this book. And I have to say, too, Tony is responsible for a, a lot of the ending of this book, because in my original draft of the story, and this is a spoiler alert, I'm sorry, I'm going to give this away. So put your hands over your ears if you don't want to hear this. In the original version of this, his wife died. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's left bereft, et cetera, et cetera, and goes off. And Tony said, you can't do that. You can't, you can't, you can't do that. So he does for his wife basically what the queen did for him at the beginning of the story and saves her life keeps her keeps her alive um so it's a happy ending um but the second book then is about a century later where he has learned 
the full effects of having been in that pond. One of which is he doesn't age. And he thought for quite a long time that the difference in the age between himself and his wife was simply that he'd been in Alpheon while she had aged 20 years here in our world, whereas he was actually only gone for a few months. Um, so he's glamored himself. He discovers he has the power to glamour because he's done all these changes when she uh, finds him, pulls him down off the, the horse. Um, he glamours himself to look uh, like he's as old as she is in, in the hopes that she'll forget that this is, you know, happened to him and that he's different than she is now. Um, so in the second book, we meet him uh, almost a century later. Um, and he's fled. He doesn't want anything to do with the elves. He doesn't want anything to do with his powers. He's basically become what is referred to as a wood woes, which is the old man of the, the, the woods, the forest in the second book. And uh, and the forest he's chosen to take take the up uh, residence in uh, is Barnsdale and Sherwood. So he's about to encounter Robin Hood, and I won't say much more than that. And that's that's what the second book is is about is Thomas and Robin Hood. The third book, um, which I'm reading research for now, uh, is set in Elizabethan times. Um, and it's more of a Thomas has fully come into his own as, as what he is, which is the, the, the nemesis of the, the elves by this point. But it's also a time where, you know, there's a lot of witchcraft trials and a lot of concern about witchcraft, et cetera. And, um, and he's working with uh, Francis Walsingham as a spy. Um, because the people Walsingham once investigated frequently line up with the people he wants to investigate. So there's kind of something going on there. And he hangs out a lot with Christopher Marlowe. So um, I've, I've even kicked around the idea of making this into like a hard boiled detective story because I've got Marlowe in it, but I'm not <laughs> sure I'm going to do that. <laughs> It's like, what can I do differently, you know, because the other two are straight down the line kind of fantasy, science, fantasy stories. The third one might just be weirder, and I don't know, but I'll find out when I start writing it. That's exciting. Wow. Well, Greg, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, Thanks. Is there, uh, is there anything else uh, that, that you wanted me to ask about the book that, uh, that we, should, we should ask, we should discuss? I don't think so. I think we've probably given away enough. <laughs> oh, but the amazing thing is the little we've given away. We've, we've talked yeah, well, about that's, that's the plot, but there's so much in this book. Yeah, I hope so. So, so uh, okay. So, uh, first of all, you've got, uh, on the assumption that this will air before then, I think it will. I think it, this airs June 9th. Okay. So, on June 17th, you have a book launch, right? For anyone in the area of Wayne, Pennsylvania, you want to tell us about that? Yep. Anybody in the Philadelphia area, yeah. Um, I have the book official book launch of Rhymer will be June 17th from 4 to 6 at uh, Main Point Books in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Um, there should be wine and food and, uh, and some laughter, I hope. But, uh... Fan fantastic. Uh, now, I, uh, embarrassingly... Um, started the conversation before we started the recording, Greg, and I said, I'm going to read a biography of you. And then I was so excited to talk about the book. I just ran, I just you forgot right to do that. <laughs> I just don't want to talk right about the book. So this okay. is completely backwards, but I'm going to read your Amazon bio now. Uh, okay. for any, and, and, you know, I don't know if David wants to edit the front, he will probably not. It will just be idiosyncratic, but, uh, appropriate. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, well, let me do that in the in the interest of completeness here. Um, Gregory Frost is a writer under the broad umbrella, umbrella of fantasy literature. That means uh, he's not speaking of elf quests and swords and magic necessarily, but of things that might fall into the bins marked high weird or uh, disturbing too. <clears throat> he writes horror, but not that sort of not the sort of splatters, rather the kind that discomfits. Fantasy and horror means to explore things that sometimes can't be come at head on. Sometimes they're put into play just to amuse, but always to surprise. 
Uh, Greg taught at writing at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania for 18 years, still does workshops at conferences and conventions. Check out his latest book, books, the Rhymer Trilogy uh, from, uh, from Bain. Um, that should have been at the front. I know. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it works. All right. Well, uh, Greg, hey, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, uh, the book is Rhymer. Uh, it is out now in hardback and also all all the ebook uh, uh, formats. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks very much for joining us on the program. Thanks, Dave. Very, very much. And now we bring you our audiobook serialization of Tinker by Wynne Spencer. Inventor girl genius Tinker lives in a near future Pittsburgh, which now exists mostly in the land of the elves. She runs her salvage business, pays her taxes, and tries to keep the local ambient level of magic down with gadgets of her own design. When a pack of wargs chase an elven noble into her scrapyard, life as she knows it takes a serious detour. Tinker finds herself taking on the Elven Court, the NSA, the Elven Interdimensional Agency, technology smugglers, and a college-minded xenobiologist as she tries to stay focused on what's really important, her first date. Armed with an intelligence the size of a planet, steel-toed boots, and a junkyard dog attitude, Tinker is ready to kick butt to get her first kiss. Because she spent most of her time at the scrapyard, either working or tinkering, she had her laundry machines hooked up in the small second bedroom. She kept her clean clothes split roughly in half between her loft and a dresser in her workshop. She was annoyed, but not surprised, to find Johnny pawing through her panties when she walked in. He had the balls to act like nothing was wrong. He held up a pair of black silk panties. Very nice. She snatched it back and stuffed it into the open drawer, trying to pretend her face wasn't burning. Do you mind? Not at all, he grinned lazily, gazing at her groin. Wouldn't mind seeing them on, either. Or off. Dream on. Let me see your hand. For a few minutes, he managed to be professional, undoing her bandaging, washing out the wound with peroxide, applying an antibiotic, and re-bandaging it. It's too deep for artificial flesh. You're going to want to go to the hospital with this. You could take nerve damage if it heals wrong, and there's a good chance it can go septic. Okay. She mentally took back some of the things she had been thinking of him until he got up and made motions of packing. Slowly, though, as if he wanted her to notice. Aren't you going to do something about Windwolf? He stopped and shrugged. Mercy won't take him. According to the peace treaty, elves are to be taken to the hospice beyond the rim. The elves don't want us messing around with them. Nothing says I have to treat him. At one time, Pittsburgh was home to dozens of world-class hospitals. Amazing what being transported to an alien world can do to health care. Mercy was the only hospital left open, doing only emergency work. Apparently only human emergency work. All elective surgery took place on Earth. There were other hospitals beyond the rim, but Tinker neither knew where they were nor wanted to be stuck at one when startup hit. It's shutdown day. The hospice is on Elf Home. So? He's stable. Wait it out. I don't know if I have enough magic to last 24 hours. I want him patched up. Well, I could be persuaded to treat him. She clenched her jaw on a few choice names. She'd let him know what she thought of him after Windwolf was patched up. What do you want? Your name appears on a very short list of women who have never put out. She clenched her fists. So, what of it? Well, there's money riding on who gets the first dip in your pool. I can pay you anything that's riding on the bet, she sneered. Oh, the prestige is more important than the money, although the money has a good bit to do with it. And then there's the thrill of conquest, going where no man has gone before. Yeah, right, with Nathan Chernowski poking around outside and Winwolf bleeding to death in here. You think I'm going to let you do me? 
Your word is good for me. I do the elf, and later I come back and do you. Some sounds, she decided, are fated to be huge no matter how quiet they are. The sound of Windwolf's knife coming out of its sheath was only a whisper of silver on leather, and yet it rang out in the room like a shout. She supposed Johnny's eyes bugging wide and his sudden frozen attention to the blade pressed to his groin helped to make the noise seem louder. You do her, Windwolf whispered, and you will never do another woman. It was a joke. Johnny swallowed hard. Get out, Windwolf commanded. Tinker glared at Windwolf as Johnny scuttled out. Why did Windwolf have to wake up now? Great. That was the only man in the tri-state area who could help you. I would rather die than stain my honor in that way. Your honor? What the hell does it have to do with your honor? It was my decision to make, not yours. I would have been the one to screw him. And you think this would not reflect on my honor? Look, I didn't really even have to sleep with him. I could have lied to him got him to treat you, and then backed out later. No one would blame me. He's a complete slime wad. Would you really break your word of honor? We'll never know. He caught her hand. Would you? How could he be so close to death and still be so strong? She finally gave up trying to get free and answered him, anger making her truthful. She considered her honor much more valuable than her virginity, which was a temporary thing to start with. No, but that didn't mean she couldn't think rings around Johnny be good any day. Tricking him without lying would have been easy, probably would even have been fun. Nathan returned from checking the scrapyard, his head tilted as he listened intently to his headset. I hate shutdown day. People just turn into raging idiots on the road. They've got like 20 cars piled up on the veterans bridge. There's possible deaths involved and apparently a fight has broken out. I've got to go. I've checked around. There was no wargs skulking around. He frowned, noticing the lack of the third person. What happened to Johnny? Oh, he opened his mouth, the normal sewage came out, and Windwolf pulled a knife on him, says his honor would be damaged. Nathan's eyes narrowed, and he muttered darkly, I'm going to bust Johnny's ass if he can't keep his mouth shut and his hands to himself. I can handle him myself. Men. All their posturing. Yet she was going to have to pick up the pieces anyhow. She guessed it didn't hurt to ask. What am I supposed to do with Windwolf? Nathan gazed at the battered elf bleakly. I don't know, Tink. Just ride it out if you can. I don't know anyone more qualified to take care of him than you. Damn it, Nathan. She followed him out to the front door. I don't know anything about healing an elf. Nobody does. Take care of yourself, Tink. Yeah. She watched him get into his squad car and pull away. Nobody else is going to do it. She bolted the front door and glanced at the office clock. One twenty. Only a little more than an hour since Winwolf came over the fence. And another twenty-three before Pittsburgh returned to elf home and its magic. Already there was a tiny slice off the top of the sink's power meter. She marked the one hour's usage, feeling a growing sense of despair. The sink would last approximately another twenty hours. Alone she couldn't move the heavy sink, and if she disconnected Winwolf from it to get him to help, he would die. And according to Tulu, if he died without the spell being cancelled, so did she. She remembered with a start that Tulu had at one time given her a cancel spell. Tinker had transcribed it into her computer as an appendix to her family's spell codex. Windwolf seemed to be asleep. Still, she did the search by hand, using the keywords of cancel, life debt. Since the workshop screen was viewable from the table, she quickly sent the spell to the printer and closed the file. The printer hummed as it spit out a page of circuit paper. Tinker picked up the paper and stared at it. Tulu had scribed the single complex glyph out, and Tinker had copied it carefully, but the blunt truth was she had no idea what the spell would do. The thought of using it smacked of putting an alien device to Windwolf's head, 
pulling the trigger, and hoping it didn't blow his brains out. Even if the spell didn't kill him outright, what if it disrupted his healing ability? At this moment, the result would be deadly. And she only had Tulu's often changing assertions that what Windwolf had done to her was harmful. Because Tulu had taught her Elvish and the fundamentals of magic, Tinker's scientific psyche allotted the half-elf with the same basic faith she had in her other teachers. If her grandfather had ever lied to her, he had done it with a mathematician's consistency and had taken all of his secrets to his grave. Oil can warned Tinker often that she was too trusting in general, so she forced herself to consider that Tulu could be lying. She sat in her still workshop, Winwolf's ragged, uneven breathing the only sound, painfully aware of the empty streets for miles in all directions, trying to decide. Did she risk killing Winwolf to save herself? Throughout Tinker's childhood, Tulu took odd perversity at being impenetrable. There was no knowing if what she told Tinker was anything more than attempts to frighten her. Windwolf, though, had saved her twice this evening, and once five years ago. Simple, cold, rational logic dictated that she owed Windwolf the benefit of the doubt. She put down the spell, but she found no comfort in her decision. Why was the unknown so much more frightening than the known? That was another installment in Win Spencer's Tinker. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judgewitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Gregory Frost and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof booth somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Oh,